So now, welcome to the Nature Journal Club. Um, today we're going to be drawing trees, and I want to also, I'm going to be uh, emphasizing some techniques of using my new favorite nature journaling painting sketching tool, the um, flat brush. Um, and I'll be showing you how to use that to make effects that you get in your, your sketching. You can do some really, really cool stuff. We'll have a future class where we'll get into um, aspects of drawing clouds and landscapes and water and these sort of things with the brush. In this class, though, we're going to be focusing mostly on drawing trees. And um, part of that is um, going to be using the brush. But we'll also just take a look at a few other sort of general tree ideas. And I'm very excited that I get to show you my new teaching tool. Um, and you're going to find out why this piece of tubing can help you become a better artist. All that in a moment. Um, so these are a couple of what I call landscape hitos. Uh, they are quick sketches of uh, of, of trees that I did in a landscape. Real size, these are about this big. Turns out if you draw trees smaller, they're easier to finish in a small, short period of time. <laughs> um, but the, the thing that makes them look tree-ish is that they're consistently inconsistent. And that's going to be the, the, the secret. If we all have this idea in our head of how does a tree look, and you know we've got this kind of this sort of Christmas tree thing, um, or, try to see if this pen works better, or this tree, you've seen this tree. And so it's a very symmetrical, very regular. These are our symbols for trees. And they end up not looking like trees. And so there's a tree out there. These symbols are so strongly kind of stuck in our heads that we kind of run in against this kind of symmetry and it really helps us not just be able to draw an accurate tree, but even a, to, to look carefully enough at a real tree in front of us to really see what is, what is happening there. So we're going to get rid of these models of trees in our head, and we're going to be replacing them with a, a shape of a tree that's going to be more consistently inconsistent. Um, irregular, the wonderful kind of irregular shapes that trees take, but they still have an overall structure that makes them look tree-ish. Um, here's another a uh, couple of um, sketches of some trees, these ones further away, these ones closer. Again, the kind of regularly irregular nature of them looks like a tree, as opposed to that thing, oh, with the squirrel hole, <laughs> right? So we're going to get away from that lollipop. And a great way of doing that is to have a tool, in this case our, our flat brush, that is going to, to make your, your sketch of the, 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 the tree work a little bit better. Because as you make marks with it, it's really easy to automatically get kind of irregularities, but all within kind of the same irregularity family. So it will make something that is regularly irregular for you. Um, these are three or four. Um, trees that I painted with this brush, and each one took a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it, is it allows you to kind of get, I don't want this side of the tree to look like this side of the tree. If it does, it'll look like a cartoon. Mm -hmm. um, so just depending on how you flick this thing, it's going to make different sorts of marks. So here, also done with this flat brush, I put in just sort of a shape of a distant snow-covered hill, and then Here's three trees, and these things took, again, a matter of seconds. And it looks like you spent a lot more time fussing around. Right? But you can get very convincing tree shapes with this. And the nice thing about this is it's not going to be kind of a formula thing, like here's how you make the pine tree, because there is no the pine tree, there's actually that tree out there. And um, but I'm going to show you an approach for drawing these things where you can get something that looks like whatever species you're looking at. Do the branches point up? Do they point down? Where are there kind of gaps and spaces between them? So the things that I'm going to be trying to do with my, my technique, number one, I'm going to try to do something that is going to allow me to kind of keep these little air holes, these little pockets, the windows in the tree, the places where the bird could fly through. Right? Because real trees have those. If you just have this big, dense 
green shape. Very often, it doesn't look like a tree, because trees have those little kind of those vents in them. Um, I want to have the shape of the branches have the right general point to them. So some, some trees like firs, they will be with their branches out like this. Some larches and things, the branches swoop down like this. Um, fir trees, so they're like this, a Douglas fir will be like this, with its branches kind of more arching up. So you're going to take your first cue from what your tree is doing, and then you're going to have a shape which will kind of give you the impression of that. We're not going to be making a branch for branch, twig for twig, leaf for leaf, or needle for needle representation. We want to kind of get the feeling of that thing with, um, with a few quick strokes. And the same is going to be true for deciduous trees. Um, if you've ever tried to draw a tree in winter and you start with, you know, you're drawing all these little dead branches, or not dead branches, but these little branches up there, and you kind of draw in more branches, and then you get sick of drawing branches, and you put a trunk on it, and it doesn't look right. Right? Um, you know, the, the, the littlest branches out here, you know, you, you're kind of putting those in, you know, uh, no, 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 it's not. No, no. So this is, we're going to also deal with those. We're going to deal with uh, drawing a deciduous tree when it has the leaves on it. Um, and so uh, this will be a lot of fun. Did anybody bring, does anybody ever, by the way, have a white crayon with them? No white crayon? If there is, then we'll have a bonus little I thing. I realized that I left my white crayon. I have a white pen. I have a white pen. Oh, uh, no, white pen. I'm looking for a crayon. No. We'll see. No. Oh, wait. No worries. All right. So here's just a quick little uh, deciduous tree. I'll do an actual live demonstration of doing something like this in a minute. Um, but. Uh, the tree's dropped all its leaves. My brush is going to quickly give me something that feels like a whole bunch of dead branches. And then from those I can hang other branches and get something that very quickly looks like a tree. <laughs> and these trees look like they took you a lot of time. But the cool thing is, once you sort of see what's going on here, you'll be like, oh. I get it. I see what you're up to here. That's actually something that, it's that brush that kind of quickly gave you those effects. Um, and if you use those effects looking at a real thing, you can get a sense of that on your page. Right, so now let's turn and do a real kind of live drawing demo of what this can look like. Alright, I'm going to pause this. Right. So you can use this brush just you know, to fill an area with tone. It makes a big, flat thing, and that's cool, all right? And that's what I thought it was for. I thought that's what you do with these. But it turns out that this chisel head shape does calligraphy with trees, and it's really cool. So what do you want to start with, deciduous or evergreen? Evergreen. Okay, it's Christmas season here. We'll put in a little Christmas tree, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm mixing up some dark paint here. This is a very dark value paint. It's um, perylene green, which uh, when I put it down on my paper, you'll see it makes a nice, rich, dark, dark uh, color. And I'm going to hold it this with the blade of the brush here. And look, I'm going to just sort of come up here and and kind of just swing it side to side. And then towards the top here, I'm going to tilt it so I'm just kind of working with the, the edge, the corner of it. Mm -hmm. And there is tree number one. And then if I want, I can take some darker colors, a little bit of Payne's gray here, into some kind of little black moments there. And wow, the kind of you get this regularly irregular tree shape. Um, depending on how I use this brush tip, I can make this tree look very different. If I, for instance, um, just work with the tip of it, I go like that, I get a little mark like that. Um, but let's see what I can do with that. I'm going to kind of come along here. And here's a different species of tree. And as I kind of come around from this side, the branches in the middle here are pointing out towards you, so I'm going to spin my brush like that as I come around. Ooh, 
right? Nice. So it's got this sort of tree-ishness to it. I'm going to put a few darks in that. Just kind of dance them into here. And there's a tree. Right, so you saw that, that, that just took a matter of seconds. And two very different looking kind of tree type things. Um, let's try one with kind of branches sweeping down. Um, I'm going to just first work out on one side of the tree. Kind of, I'm just little marks that are out like that. Then the other side of the tree. And then some parts here are kind of pointing towards me. And there'll be a trunk somewhere in there. And this part here kind of looks a little bit globby. Don't like that. I don't really like the tip of this tree so much. I mean, anytime you don't like the tip of your tree, which is one of the most important parts of your tree, just make your tree a little bit taller. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to then take the tip of this, just kind of make this. Oh, okay, I'm liking that. A little bit better. All right. So you can get the, the branches pointing just about any way you want. But notice how I'm sort of just spinning back and forth here. And I'm not blocking things. I'm, I'm dancing that brush. And it makes tree-like shapes. Um, trees will be helped by a few darker accents, places where there are shadows in the core of the tree. And there you go. Um, Something that hurts a lot of people's trees is um, <laughs> viridian. Um, you have a bright, it's a, it's a color of paint that is green. just screaming loud plasticky green. And uh, some kits, it's like, it's the green that they give you. And so um, if your kit comes with a green that is really unnatural, then you can get a different green. Or anytime you don't like your green, if it feels too kind of electricy plasticky, just cut it with a little bit of red or magenta, and it will become a much more natural shade of green. Does anybody have viridian in their palette? I think I might. Okay, we, we, we bring it over and we'll just sort of show people how to kind of control the, the, the viridian demon. Um, so these are a few coniferous trees. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so let's say your kit comes with that color, right? Yeah. Does and that look stains, familiar? It stains yeah. so much. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it stains, and there it is. And where do you see that in nature? Well, you see that when somebody brings their watercolor palette out and you look down at their watercolor palette, right? But that same color, if it just has a little bit of red um, into it, actually, that cuts it. Um, so now I'm going to just mix a little bit of red with some viridian here. It's a little bit too viridian-y. Right. Mm -hmm. It just turned into something that is a little bit much more palatable. Mm -hmm. right? um, really with any color, that if your color feels too bright, I like that color. But you want to dull it a little bit, you put in some red and it becomes more olivey. And that's what you're doing with that viridian, is you're taking your viridian moment and you're just making it a little bit more olivey. Mm -hmm. oh, right. yeah. So, um, again, you can, you can change the color in your palette. Um, also, you can cut those things with a little bit of, 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 of uh, magenta or red. Thank you. Um, let's take a look for a moment at some deciduous trees. Right. Um, 
again, having some places where the air comes through the tree is going to be important. What I do is, if I'm, I'm, I'm going to be making up a tree here, when I'm out in the field, what I do is I actually look at the shape of the tree. So I'm just sort of imagining there's some big blocks of foliage in these areas on my tree. And I'm trying not to get that kind of bump, da 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 bump, da da bump, the cloud tree shape. And because this is angular, it's kind of making points and things, and it feels less bump, da da bump, da da bump. Um, and then I'm going to put a hint of leafy texture into this. Um, and to do that, so here's my, my brush tip. All right. What I want to do is I want to turn this brush into my second tool, which is going to be really good for kind of leafy, textury sorts of things. Um, and what I want you to do is I want everybody to concentrate their mind on the tip of this brush, and I want you to imagine it fraying out into little multiple points. Mm -hmm. Right? So concentrate on it. Concentrate. Keep working on it. That's good. That's working. It's working. <laughs> right? Keep, keep, keep working on it. All right? Keep focus on that. Keep turn. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Look what we did. All right? So you just turned this into a multiple little... Th what? Actually, how did that happen? You it was yeah. It wasn't the force. I just twisted the handle here. I hold this part here, and you go from you 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 hold this part here, and you twist, and it starts to turn into there. You go. Look at that. Look at that. Like a little crown of thorns there. I mean, wow. Yeah. So what can I do with that? I'm going to come back here, pick up some paint. And just a little bit of that across the top here. So what it's doing is it's making all sorts of little leafy blotches, right? So I'm going to put a little bit of that texture. And when you first do this, it's going to be so much fun. You're going to want to do it in, over the entire tree. <laughs> right? Avoid that temptation. Is that the same color? Is it slightly darker? Oh, this is just, this is, a, I think, maybe a, it's a lighter value color, but sort of thicker paint. Oh, OK. And you can get those sort of leafy things in there. Nice. Ooh, ooh. Mm -hmm. um, this little effect, by the way, you know, you can do all sorts of other things with it. Mm. And there's sort of the feeling of a oh, yeah. of, of of grasses meadow. and a little meadow. And here's my bush in my meadow, <laughs> right? And a little bush, oh, and nice. I'm gonna go arc, 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 arc. Wow. Um, isn't that neat? That is. And then. I spin it back the other way, and my brush goes back to being its little chisel self. Wow! <laughs> right? That's pretty cool. Um, now, I can either draw um, trunk, with the edge of this thing, I'll show you how to do that. Um, or this would also be a point where you could sort of take your regular brush um, and do it. So if you're drawing with the tip of it, you can kind of use the corner of it and, and you can get um, some smaller branches and things in there. Still, these are a little bit, they're, they're kind of rough. Um, and this might be also a point where you would put down this big brush. I mean, the, uh, I, these things that often do make kind of some really nice organic shapes, though. Um, and you could use a smaller kind of fine point brush, like our regular water brush at this point. And then I'm going to have sort of sticking out here some kind of branches that have been need a little bit less love. If you just stop your tree there, it feels like it's floating in the air. And um, a good way of grounding your tree is just to put the shadow underneath it. And then the tree feels like it's actually sitting somewhere. Same with these, these, these levitating trees out here. Um, if you're out on a winter day, you've got those wonderful blue shadows underneath um, trees on the snow, um, mm -hmm. you put 
some you know, just sort of you kind of ground your tree down and then it it feels like it's not floating on the tree so here's this one got its shadow that one got its shadow the trees if just on their own out there sometimes sort of feel like they're floating now this brush um, it still has a lot of water in it but at this point I'm going to take a little break from this to, I'm going to pretend that this brush is running out of water because I want to show everybody how to put water in these things because um, there's, a, there's a trick to it you unscrew the cap and there's a little black piece here with a hole in it and but that hole is so small you stick that under the cap and you go <laughs> um, and you wait and you wait and you wait and it doesn't fill up. So what's, it's being blocked by the air pressure in here. So what you want to do is with the faucet running under it or put it submerged in water, you're going to squeeze it to get the air out and then as you unsqueeze it, it's sucking. Uh -huh. So you're, with the tap running over it, you're going to go squeeze, 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 squeeze. And eventually what happens is this fills up and then you'll know it's filled because as you squeeze, it'll start to squirt. So you squeeze until it squirts. So you just go do 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 under running water, and then all of a sudden it'll start to be squirting as you're squeezing, and then you stop, and now you've got it filled. So, so using my teeth to pull that thing out was not the problem. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, but but I've, I've done the same thing. First when I got these, I was like trying to pry this thing out, like what is with this? This is just a nuisance. And then like, yeah. and then you kind of break your teeth, yeah. and then and then you need dentures and yeah. kind of more dental work, and that just that ain't right. And you're being a bad role model. Yeah. Um, but there's a few other things we can do with this because uh, let's make a tree in winter. You know how in winter the trees get um, all those sort of fine branches at the top. And those beautiful little fine branches, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to spin till it frays at the top. Isn't that great? That is That's crazy. That I, I haven't seen this advertised anywhere in their stuff. I haven't seen this in any videos. I, I kind of found this by accident. But I think they should advertise this as a feature of the brush. Right? It does that, and that's neat. Um, I'm going to pick up some paint. I want fine little branches up here. Um, and here is, here are some of those fine little, little branches on the tip of my tree. And in wintertime, you'll see different species of trees will have different colors. It's neat, uh, you go romping around in the Sierra, you'll see some willows really red, mm -hmm. some very yellow, some orange. All right, so those are my littlest twigs on the tops of this tree. And then I put this thing back and it's good. All right. Does somebody have a regular, um, the Pentel, uh, Water brush of oh, I've got one over here. Let me get this. And then what I'm going to do is pick up my other water brush. Here's the other water brush that I love. This is the large fine point Pentel um, water brush. I don't use the small one. I don't use the medium one. This is the large point one. And when you get a brand new water brush, sometimes a little bit more water will come through the tip than you want it to. But don't worry, you just keep using it. That will kind of eventually take care of itself. I first just kind of give it a dry on my sock and <coughs> pick out some color. <coughs> and now I'm going to drag the tip down. I put my hand on my paper and just lightly have the tip down and I'm going to drag that tip down. If I push with it, it, um, it makes a mark that is too thick. See, if I push with it, it splays and gets bigger. If I drag with it, it's skinny. Mm -hmm. So you drag for skinny. If you push with it, it is irregular and, and a lot thicker. All right, I'm going to start doing this again. branches here. If you um, feel that your brush is too wet, just stop and dry it on your sock again. Uh, 
This tree is also kind of coming out a little bit anemic, so I'm going to go for some Bloodstone Genuine here, which is a wonderful Daniel Smith dark color. Oh, I see, I like that a lot better. So you, can, you, you, you can just draw with it up into those branches, and somewhere up in those branches, don't take it all the way out to the tips of it, you stop drawing and just let it uh, those little tiny twigs be the things that kind of take over from there. <laughs> we have to kind of ground this thing in, and there is <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I find it's easier to not stop uh, start at the bottom of the trunk and go up into the tree, but have those upper branches and bring my lines down from them. Mm -hmm. So you pull your branches down into your trunk mm -hmm. rather than kind of coming up. Because you're coming up here, number one, you're starting to push your tip. Um, but also sometimes you'll kind of get out there and you're like out at the end of your tree and you're too thick still. Yeah, right, that so. keeps you thin at the top. Keeps you thin at the top. You get your hands on the side and you kind of just thin things, thumb mm -hmm. coming down, coming down. And then sort of like a river connecting all those in with each other. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, the other, so the two water brushes that I recommend for people, the Pentel, not the Niji, but the Pentel, large, fine point water brush. Um, and then this is the Kuretake water brush that is the, they advertise it as two in one. I'm going to show you that it's three in one. You've seen two, uh, two of the three so far. That chisel tip, which we did all this stuff with, and that splay tip. The other thing you can do with this two in one brush is you can hold the tip of it right here and pull that off. This whole head is a big mop brush. Right, so um, you can with that. You know, you want to fill large areas with some color, right? Or you want to kind of get really wispy in the the sky. Oh, nice. right? I can do kind of dry brush effects with this thing. Um, that's a lot of fun. I can also put thicker paint on it when it's dry, and then fan it out like this. Look at that. I'm just taking it and fanning it with my fingers. And now, when I make a mark, I want more darker paint. Again, um, you know, so that could be little marks. I'll put in some darks into these grasses here. <coughs> or larger marks. So a very, very useful, useful, versatile brush. You can get all those different, and in the future we'll have another workshop where we're not just looking at trees, but we're looking at what are all the fun things that you can do with this. We'll play with water, we'll play with rocks, we'll play with kind of landscapes, skies. You can do lots of cool stuff with that two in one. Isn't that crazy? Very, very useful, fun little brush. Um, well, actually, I'm just kind of looking at these. I'm seeing especially this one here, that's really a dense tree. See how this is, it's all, except for a couple of spots here, it's really filled in. Trees, I'm finding, again, I mentioned those little places where the, for the birds to fly through. I'm going to try to do another tree there and give it um, just a, a little bit more airiness. And um, I like often on one side to make it, you know, here I've got like a big gap right up there. These branches are going to come out more on this side. Maybe it's got more wind on this side.
but just sort of having more kind of holes. You end up, it's fun to use this brush, so you end up filling up all those holes, and then there's again fewer places for those birds to fly through. And and it doesn't it doesn't look as good. So give keep your your let your tree have some little bird holes. Also, if I have it slightly slightly crimped as I'm making my tree, I can then I'm gonna get You know how um, some pines have their their needles in more clusters. Now this is a little bit too crimped. I want yeah, that's better. This is giving me some of my needles and bunches. A few kind of dead branches sticking out. Dead branches sticking out in your forest or off the bottom of your tree are oh, nice. Take a look at your tree, the real tree. You might see them. If you don't, then don't put them in. That is fun with a new brush. Now, what um, I hate it when a teacher in a class shows you a cool tool. And it says, all right, now you got to go out and get one. And you're like, well, I don't have one right now. It's not going to do me much good. Um, so I bought um, more than 100 of these things and um, brought them to the other classes, and they bought them all. Um, so by the time I got down here, <laughs> we're out of brushes. But the next time I come, I will have more of these brushes. You can also buy them in art supply stores. Make sure you're getting that Kuretake 2-in-1. Um, or you can pick one up for me next time you're in one of these classes. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to play with this because I want to tell you Audie's secret. This is important. Audie was my grandmother. And she was a watercolor painter. And I came to her and I said, Audie, what is the secret to making, uh, you know, what are, how, do I use, how do I use watercolor? And she had all these different brushes. She had the masking fluid, all these different things. And she said, Jack, honey, there aren't any rules. The most important thing is to play with it and kind of just see what it does. Mess around with it. Mm -hmm. um, so that the next time you're, you're painting with it, it's not a surprise. It will do all these sort of surprising things, but you kind of know the constraints of it. So there aren't any rules. The most important thing is to play. And that's what we're actually going to do right now. We're just going to take maybe 10 minutes and we're going to play with our flat water brushes. Who wants to use this one? All right. Um, our flat water brushes, and we're going to just make different tree-ish marks. Experiment with the different sorts of textures. Don't worry about making a pretty picture. The goal is to mess around with it, mm -hmm. right? And then you're going to see, see what you get. Um, the next time that you want to be painting a tree in one of your landscapes, if these different textures and things are things that you kind of, you feel you, you're comfortable with them and you kind of reliably make them, work for you, then you'll be able to incorporate them into the flow of what you're doing. But if the next time you're like, oh my gosh, like I can turn this and maybe there's some sort of dotty effect, but I'm not really sure because I haven't messed with it, um, it will be scary and it won't be much fun and it probably won't work. So what we're going to do right now is just going to take a break. We're going to play. No rules. Just mess around with it. See how it works. And um, then after that, I'll give you a few more trip, tricks and tips on drawing trees. All right, I want to show you one last important trick. Hold on a minute. Spin this around. One last important trick um, with these uh, water brushes. And what it is, is that the big, the big no-no with a water brush is when you put the cap on, you take some of the bristles and they get bent backwards by the cap. And that can happen when you're putting this cap on 
or this cap on, or with the other water brush. So what you want to do is whenever you're putting one of these caps on, is really look at it carefully, make sure there's no errant bristle sticking out to the side. Put that part on carefully, make sure you've got it in there. And then when you're putting this next part in, make sure you're getting all the bristles in before you push it in together. And then you're not going to have bristles that are mm. um, Once they're bent in a goofy angle, there's nothing you can do but sort of snip them off. They're gonna be, they're gonna be gone. But, um, so you can just sort of be aware as you're putting your caps on, that's the time just a little bit to just cramp it on and, and head out the trail or you'll end up with a few um, sad and lonely brushes. <laughs> All right. Now what we're gonna do is take a look at a few ideas about drawing trunks. Um, tree trunks are fun. Um, this was a neat one I found on one of our field trips. <clears throat> it was the Ouroboros um, uh, trunk where it had, had split and grown and then it started eating its own tail. It kind of came back mm -hmm. together, so it was making this full loop. I've never seen that in a tree, where the tree kind of came back and then into itself. Um, so it was a full donut. Um, and I wanted to draw that in a way that kind of could suggest the shape and the dimensions of these trunks. Here's another little trunk view. Sometimes trunks of trees, they're some really neat shapes. Um, what I recommend you not do when you kind of are into a trunk is to get out under the tree, start drawing the trunk, and then you just start painting and drawing and painting and drawing and stopping when you reach the edges of your page. Um, what's going to happen is you're going to get really sick of drawing leaves somewhere partway through that process. And also, then the size of your page is determining your composition, and you probably won't like your composition. So what I do when I'm into some trunk section is I figure out this is the part of the trunk section that I'm really interested in. I make a mental box around that. I put a box around my piece of paper. And then I draw that part that I'm interested in with it in there. And see, if this, if I was interested in this and I drew the whole rest of the tree, I'd be spending a lot of time drawing, spending a lot of time in little leaves that I'm not really as interested in. This allows me to draw where I'm curious. Same thing here. And look at this. In this, I got away with drawing all this trunk stuff with how many leaves did I draw? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe, maybe 20 leaves in there. And they, here, these are kind of in clumps. And so you're not getting lost in the leaves. Um, so how can you get this sort of sense of space or the, whether a trunk branch is coming towards you or sloping away from you? You can actually suggest that very effectively in your sketches, and I want to show you how. Once you start doing this, what you're going to find is you're going to walk through the forest and you'll see a tree branch. And like, oh my gosh, I love this tree branch. How many people got into drawing twigs since our last workshop? No twig drawers? Oh, you guys didn't do your homework. Um, the, uh, the same thing can happen though with tree branches. You'll be walking along and you'll see like, oh my gosh, this is a gorgeous, this is a gorgeous branch. And they'll sit there and you'll spend time sketching and drawing it. Where somebody who this isn't on their radar, they're just kind of walking through the forest, oh, that's kind of neat, that's kind of neat, that's kind of neat. But the more that like a beautiful branch can be on your radar and something that you will geek out with, just the world is more of a beautiful place. So here's how to geek out with a branch. First, we're going to try to, uh, we're going to get some sort of depth in the placement of trees. Think about your tree as a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. Right? So the trees that the branches that are in front of the tree, kind of closer to me, I'm going to draw those in first. And I'm also press a little bit harder with my pencil. And if there's more detail, those guys are going to get more detail. And in this, you want to look at the real shape of real branches. The idea that we have in our head of how branches should look is wrong. Our mental model of how branches look is wrong. It's our mental model is all this kind of thing. Hmm. Yeah, maybe they're getting thicker as they go down, but it's, I mean, look at this. I mean, this branch is going to dump, da dump, da dump, right? If I were to make up a branch, it probably wouldn't be doing that, but the tree did, and so you get to do that too. So you're kind of like, oh, wow, that's neat. Then what I'm going to do is, because this is the front part, I'm now going to put in the next layer behind that of the branches that are a little bit further behind that. I'm going to press a little bit more lightly. Talk about not making up branches. 
Look at this thing. It comes down, over, up, around. I mean, would you make something like that up? No. I mean, your mental model of what branches do would never include something like that, because that just is wrong in our heads. But you start looking around on trees, they're going to do all sorts of crazy stuff like this. And it's really, really fun. So believe the tree. When in doubt, believe the tree. But also notice that this is drawn a little bit more lightly than this branch back here, which puts, pops that one forward. And then the background branches, even lighter. And if you started these ones in the background, you'd have to erase some of these things to put in your foreground ones. But because you're going from front to back, you don't have to erase anything. This just kind of gets you thinking progressively back in the picture, and that helps you get some depth, some depth in your pictures. But something that this kind of drawing, this just is the outlines of these branches, a piece of information that is missing from this is whether the branch is leaning towards you or away from you or is straight out to the side. So this branch coming out here, is it tilted out like this? Or is it like this? There's actually no visual clue in my drawing that will tell you. But you can. And so here's how you do it. Right. It's going to be with contour lines. So a contour line is a line that goes all the way around the circumference of an object. So if that were on me, it would be going all the way around here. All right. Any line that wraps around your round object and is a straight line around it, as it changes its angles, it is... Oh, could, here, could you close that door for me? Thanks. Um, the, um, as it changes its angles, it's telling you something about the shape of this branch. All right? So, um, also notice that this is coming this way, this is coming with it. These lines here, they're making little parentheses towards each other. On the far side, they go the opposite direction. All right. So um, the direction of these lines, of these contour lines, carves the object. So this is my hypothetical model of something that is curving towards you and then curving away. A tube that is curving away from you and curving towards you. So let's take a look at it this way. All right. On this object here, um, the lines that are right, these ones here are curved like parentheses in towards the curve towards you. If I flip it this way, then it's straight in the middle, but these ones around here, it's a curve this way, these backwards parentheses. So, um, the direction that a line has is going to tell you something about the shape and the direction that that object is pointing. Right. Let's actually back up from that and start a little bit simpler, just with a straight log. If you're looking at it from the side, these rings make little lines across it. All right. So if I'm making up a kind of, here's my hypothetical tree. If I draw lines across this, that's saying these branches are just straight like this. How would that change if this branch tilted towards you. Hmm, let's figure that out. Um, first, I'm going to do one other thing. I'm going to take this, I'm going to get out my chainsaw, and I'm going to cut through this tree. All right? So I've just cut out a little chunk. If I'm looking at it straight on like this, and I cut out a chunk here, I now have these little straight edges here. I'm not getting to see any of this round surface. <laughs> Right? So, but now, I'm going to see what happens if I take these lines, these straight lines, and I just draw them 
as a curve instead. And look at what it does to the apparent angle of the branch. Wow. Which side is closer to you now? Isn't that neat? Yeah. So this, it feels like it's coming out at you like this. And now take a look at the angles on this tube. When I hold this like this, can you see how what was a straight line is now a curve? If I... So straight lines feels like this. A curved line... Now let's, let's cut that little section out of it again. You see that if you have it cut here, if this end is tilted towards you, you're now seeing this surface here. Right? And you're not seeing this one here. So you're seeing this surface here. This cut of these lines, imagine that as something going all the way around. It's an oval going all the way around that trunk. Each one of these little ridges goes all the way around the trunk. And I tur turn that at an angle, and it's curved. So drawing in that curve takes this and does that. What would happen if I put those curved lines in the opposite direction? Visualize what it's going to look like. Those lines, if I just took them and curved them in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> You're good at visualizing. <laughs> See that? Do that again? Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll have just a moment. We'll flip it back and forth between these and two. You, and you couldn't see the, if you cut it, you'd see the other side of the, yeah, ah, that's what I was trying to say. Yes. <laughs> if you cut it, it would do that. That was much better. Right? So now, now let's, then you said, can we flip back and forth between those? Well, yeah. let's do that. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right? Yeah. See, these ones are a C this way. The C points towards the side that's coming towards you. The C goes this way. The dyslexic C points towards the side that's coming towards you. <clears throat> Is that cool? Mm -hmm. Wow. Right? So you can give, you can, you can pop your branches out of the plane of the drawing. And a branch doesn't have to just be doing this or this. If a branch has a curve in it, it can be in some places coming towards you and some places going away from you. So on this one, it's, the entire tree is seized that way. But if, So take a look at this. The way I drew this, I just made up parts of this branch that are going to come towards you and I was going to wait. At this point here, I drew a straight line across my trunk. At this point here, I drew a straight line across my trunk. Right? At this point here, I drew a straight line across my trunk. And then what I did is I made these go this way. Right? And these will do that until they get to here. And then I flipped them. Right? And so these are going to do this, and then these are going to come here until I get to here, and now I'm going to flip them. And what that does is that this then feels like it is going away from you. This part feels like it's coming towards you. Let me erase those little blue lines. And if I had moved that place where there's the vertical line to here, then it would feel like the inflection point was right there. Right? There's nothing special about that spot. Right? I could have done that anywhere, and that would have just put the little undulation in this in a different spot. So you flip the lines when the branch direction changes. Yeah, so, right, so if I, if, if there's the, at the inflection point where this is going away from me, now it's going to start coming towards me, that's where the vertical line goes. At the point where this has been coming towards me and now it's going to start to go back the other way, that's where the vertical line goes. Oh, I see. Yeah. You don't have to memorize this. 
Because if you're sketching out in the field, you can look at the tree. And the tree will have on it these lines. So this might be a place where a sap sucker has come along. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, or um, the coast live oaks that we have around here have all these great little elephant wrinkles in their skin. There's a crack in the bark. All those things. Anytime you see a circumferential line around a round branch, it is a gift from nature allowing you to show more dimension in your branch, saying that this is coming towards you or away from you. So when you see those little moments, you're actually making decisions about what you're going to include and not. When you see those circumferential lines, that should be a little bell going off, ding, include this, because it will really describe the shape of this branch a lot. Put some shadows in. Mm -hmm. With those shadows, it also helps give you a sense of the roundness of this thing. Sorry, Jack, when you have, you have the straight lines, so, so you're going along like with your parentheses around your straight line, and then you get to the next straight lines, is that one already mm -hmm. starting? Did so, they, at one point they run into... So here, I'll, what, what I'm doing, that's, that's a great question. So I've got a straight line and a straight line over here. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to do this <coughs> parentheses around here. Mm -hmm. And as I get closer to this, these lines are going to get progressively straighter. Oh, okay. And then on the other side of that, it's going to start to flip the other way. The other way. Uh -huh. okay. So... Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So... Where you have those lines, that's going to be the place where, you know, as the closer you get to it, the more straight it gets. And then, but at that point, that's where the flip happens. But the nice thing about this, again, is that this is actually what you'll be seeing on the tree. And so you're looking for those marks and where you include those in. Um, or if you are just kind of on autopilot putting little lines and things on the tree and you're not paying attention to this, your tree won't have that shape. And then you can correct it, kind of going like, oh yeah, I've got to pay attention to the, what's this tree doing? Another thing that can, <coughs> in addition to this shadow, that can help you get a sense that there, this is a round trunk is to put in cast shadows on the trunk. So if there's another branch above this branch, and this branch's shadow falls down on the branch that you're looking at, some really cool things start to happen. And they're a little bit counterintuitive, right? So you see how the, the shadow comes down, and then it hooks in, down, and whoa, right? You think a, this is the shadow of a straight stick over a round branch. And that straight stick shadow curves because it is on top of this curving branch. And the same thing here. Um, and it's a little bit counterintuitive, but good news is there's no rule here that you have to memorize. You don't have to memorize some pattern. If you're just aware that shadows going around a round branch, they're going to do this sort of strange counterintuitive hook thing, then when you're out there in the field and you see, oh, look, there's a cast shadow on that branch. <laughs> this is another thing that I'm going to include in my sketch, right? Because it's going to really help me show the dimension of this. And then you just look at what that shadow does. And talk out loud to it. You say, like, right, you're going to come in, you're going to come down straight, and then there's going to be a kind of a quick inflection point, and it's hooking, it's actually hooking all back. Huh. Well, that's weird, right? Mm -hmm. Why is that going? If it does, if the geometry doesn't make sense to you, just believe what you see. Mm -hmm. But talk your way through it, because what you're going to want to do, what your brain is going to want to do, is to make the shadow like that. Right? It's a straight stick going across that. Therefore, it should make a straight shadow, but it won't, because it's going over 
a round thing and a really fun exercise to do. These were just two, I just took two pieces of paper, I rolled them up and taped them together and just sat out in the sun one afternoon with these little things and took one on the other and kind of looked at what they did. And you play with it like that and you'll be like, oh, I kind of get these things. And then when you're out there, you see those hooking shadows, you're like, oh yeah, we got this. <laughs> So that, my friends, is a handful of tricks to help you play with some trees, to help you play with some branches. We looked at some approaches with that flat brush to be able to kind of get the regularly irregular things that pop out in trees. We've taken a close look at branches and kind of are understanding a little bit more of the kind of geometry of those. There also are two other video workshops on my website that are um, tutorials on drawing trees. And with the exception of that thing where I'm showing you know, foreground, middle ground, and background, I think and also in one of those I have this slide. But all the rest of the content is totally different stuff. Um, so if you're looking for more ideas to kind of help you in your tree drawing, there's a bunch of other videos that you can uh, also check out there. But all the stuff that we've just looked at, um, your brain is going to forget it all in a matter of days if you don't do something with it. So, I am going to give you a project to make this stick in your head. And this is a, um, an exercise from Audie. Yeah. Who you ask is Audie. She's my grandmother. Right? Um, Audie, um, or Beatrice Chalice, um, um, she was a watercolor painter, and I'd go down to her house and she would do little drawing workshops with me, and she was sort of my drawing muse, my drawing mentor was as a kid growing up. And I remember in particular this one time when I asked her how she did her watercolors, and I said, what, what, is your, what are the rules of how you use watercolor? And she stopped and she said, no honey, Jack honey, there aren't any rules, dear. The most important thing is just to play with it and see what it does. And just mess around with it. Give yourself the room and the time to experiment with it. Not where you're trying to make a picture and you want it to do a specific thing, but just in little exercises. Just play with it and see what it does. So with these flat brushes, be like Audi. Right? My charge to you is I want you to do four or five Audi pages where you're just taking those tools and playing with them and messing around with them and seeing what they do. Can you, what happens when I, when I dance the brush this way? Um, is it looking too mechanical and regular? Maybe can I get a little bit of a stutter into, my, into my, my, my motion with my wrist? What happens when I do that same thing with it dialed in so that it's now a little, a little bit frayed, more frayed? What do all those effects look like? And play with those, see what happens, not in an environment where it's possible to make any mistakes, because these are just little experimental studies. Play with it. So Audi says, just take it home and play with it. And I think that's some of the best advice that we can. Um, how many people in this room are going to commit to filling at least four pages with little studies for Audi? Studies for Audi. Yes. All right? Excellent. So that means when we come here next month, you're going to have four studies for Audi. Four pages of just packed with little studies for Audi. If you do more, even better. All right? Um, and the, I have uh, one more um, I thought that I'd like to kind of close with. Um, today is my dad's birthday. Aww. And in honor of him, um, I have another charge for you that has nothing or perhaps everything to do with the Nature Journal Club. Um, my dad was really engaged in his community, and he was a deeply kind and thoughtful person. Um, my request for you today, um, and going forward this week, in honor of Robert Laws, is to think about your actions in your community and what are things that you can do? Are there some small things or large things that you have always thought you would like to do, but you never really started? Right? Is there something that you can do to spread kindness and civic action in your community um, to make it a little bit of a better place? Um, if so, 
remember my dad and make our world and our community a little bit of a better place. And thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday, Dad. Happy birthday, Dad.